Well, it's great to see everybody out this morning. I love Sundays. Anybody else love Sundays? Yeah, I love Sundays, not just because of football, but I love to come together with the family on a Sunday. And the Eagles are out anyway, and the Giants are out anyway, so you have all the reason to come this morning. So, but, uh, but welcome, welcome, welcome this morning. I, I'm so excited to, to be here. My name is Brandon. I'm the communications director here at the Center Lehigh Valley, and it's just an honor to be here before you. And uh, we've had just an amazing, uh, well, this will be the third week, but two weeks so far of our series on conversations with God. Hasn't it been amazing? Yeah. So, uh, so today I have the privilege of, uh, of continuing that. And you just have to bear with me a little bit. I was told I have to stand between this line over here and this line over here because of the camera. Uh, I was born and raised Pentecostal, so it's going to be tough, but I'll manage to do it somehow, you know. But uh, it's an honor to be here. So I want you to say this with me. Say that I am a house of prayer. We are a house of prayer. Amen. Let's pray real quick. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here in, your, in this place to assemble together, Father God, as your body, as the, as the church, Father, as the bride of Christ. It is an honor to be here today. So Lord, as we partake in your word, we just ask you, uh, Holy Spirit, to give us wisdom and give us revelation to reveal things to us, to reveal lies to us that have been given to us by the enemy and to, to bring light into those areas that we would walk in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, and his shed blood. We thank you for all that you're doing for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So the first week of this series, uh, we talked about one-on-one -on -one conversations with God. And Pastor James Moore brought that, and it was amazing. And what I pulled from that, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. That was awesome. And he, he left us knowing that uh, we serve a God that hears us and he answers prayers. Okay? It's not just hearing us, but he answers our prayers. And along with that, that we need to remain persistent in our prayers. We can't give up. That sometimes it's going to be a struggle, that sometimes it might seem like all is lost, but if we would remain persistent, God hears and he answers. We must just remain in faith. Amen? So then last week, uh, Joseph came and just tore it up up here. I, the, the stage is still burning, and my feet are hot right now, but he talked about what, what, what prayer looks like as a family unit. And one thing I pulled from it more than anything is that prayer as a family it pleases God, and it's non-negotiable, that we have to make it non-negotiable in our lives. I believe he said that every Wednesday, they get together around the dinner table, and that's when we talk about things, that's when they pray, and it's non-negotiable. Has anybody taken the challenge to make that non-negotiable in their lives as a family? So this week, I get to talk about conversations with God um, and what that looks like corporately here as a body, what that looks like uh, it here as, as, uh, at, at TCLV, it, so that we can establish a place for the Holy Spirit. How many know that we have to establish a place for the Holy Spirit? So go with me. Uh, it's, this has been our primary verse during this time. Go with me to Matthew 21 and 13. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version first. It says, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, I want to look at the before and the after verse of this so we can get the full context of it. Verse 12 says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all of those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Verse 14, I want you to remember this verse. Then the blind and the lame man, lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Remember that verse. So if we look at this, we would just think, okay, he came into the temple and he just kicked out those who were just selling things and doing business in there. But there was actually a backstory to this. There's a lot more to this if we look into it. These merchants, they operated in, in the outer courts of the temple. Now, I want you just to stay with me in the beginning as I lay the foundation for this. They operated in the outer courts of the temple, 
And that was the only area that the Gentiles could come to pray. And this made it possible, this made it impossible for the Gentiles to come and pray in that area because they were present in that area and they weren't supposed to be there. But not only weren't they supposed to be there, they were also um, abusing the temple. They were in there and what they did was the money changers, they weren't just in there for business. When people came to worship in Jerusalem, when visitors would come, they would go and exchange their coin so that they could present the proper offering to the Lord, the proper kind of coin. And then those that were selling doves were selling them so that they could be used as a sacrifice in there. Here's the problem. They weren't just doing business, but they were jacking up the prices on all of these things so that people had no option but to spend more in the temple. So really what happened here was those who were seeking God's presence were being shut out by the very people of God's house. And on top of it, to make it even worse, the priests were in on this. They were, they were the ones that allowed the money changers and those who were selling the doves to be there. They were connected to what was going on. So they abused the temple and they corrupted the intention of it. I want you to remember that. They abused the temple and corrupted the intention of it. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Somebody say house of prayer. Okay, this was not an idea. This was not a suggestion, but it was a command. And this same word still rings through right now that my house shall be called a house of prayer. Whether it's individually, whether it's as a family, or whether it is as assembly, my house, this house shall be called a house of prayer. Non-negotiable. Now, Let's go a little bit further. Go with me now to Malachi 3 and 1. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. You're probably like, How, why are we going to the Old Testament now? What does this have to do with anything? Let me show you. Malachi 3 and 1 says, okay, I might have, it might be 3 and 3, I apologize. Behold, no, three and one. Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Okay, he's talking about John the Baptist here. This is a prophecy. And the Lord, the Messiah, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger or the angel of the covenant, whom you desire, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like, and like Fuller's soap. He's talking about cleansing here. Verse three, and he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the priests and the sons of Levi, who were, known to, who were the priests, and, and refine them like gold and silver. Does anybody need to be refined like gold and silver today? And it says that they may offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness, okay? So Jesus was fulfilling, when he went into that temple and tore things up and kicked out the money changers and, and started to straighten things out, he was fulfilling a 400-year-old prophecy. It was actually over 400 years. He was fulfilling the prophecy in Matthew 21. Now get this, this also wasn't the second time that he went into a temple. It's believed that also in, in the book of John that he did it once one other time, and that time he took a whip with him, okay? So twice he did this. Now, when he left, I'll just put this as a side note, he obviously didn't set up a committee to make sure that the money changers and those people didn't come back in, okay? So because of that, he left this verse for us so that we would follow it and apply it ourselves. He left this example so that we'd see it and know that we ourselves need to make sure that we are becoming a house of prayer and we are a house of prayer. So. I want you to get this. You say, how could this possibly apply to me? We're talking about priests. If you took Christ as savior, you also took him as the purger and the purifier that we are talking about in Malachi here. It says that he will sit as a refiner and, purif and purifier of silver, and he will purify the priests and the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver that they, that they may offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Well, I'm not a priest. Yes, you are. 
Yes, you are. To purify oneself, it means to properly, to be bright, by implication to, pure, to be pure, to be clear, to be unadulterated, to Levitically be uncontaminated, morally innocent or holy, or to make oneself or to pronounce clean and cleanse from self, to purge, to purify. This is to purify. To purge means to extract. My question is, what is it in our lives right now that we need to purge or extract from ourselves to become this house of prayer that he wants us to be? We're in the end times, folks. Jesus is coming at some point soon, okay? We have to make sure that we are a body and a bride that is a good representation of what he wants to come back for. We need, this was my prayer recently. Father, I thank you that you help us to become the bride that is beautiful and worthy that Jesus deserves. <laughs> to be that, that means we can't take uh, uh, being coming a house of prayer and becoming beautiful like he deserves a joke anymore. It has to be something that we're, we're, we are willing to lay our lives down as a sacrifice and be willing to go through this purging and be willing to go through this extraction, be willing to go through this purification project process by him. He's not doing it to hurt us. He's actually doing it so he can get more of him in us. Okay? So, how does this apply to me still? I'm not a pastor. I'm not a leader. It talks about priests. Okay, go with me a little bit further. Let me show you here. Revelations 1, 5 through 6. Here's what it says. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Has anybody, anybody in here been washed by the blood of Jesus? Okay, this applies to you then. Verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You are a king and you are a priest before God the Father. Right now, where you sit, you are a king and you are a priest. Now, the life of a priest was specifically set aside to serve God to minister to God and to know God, and he was not burdened down by his own ways and own plans. Why is that? Because his ways were God's ways and his plans were God's plans. And my question is, is there anybody in here today where your ways have to be God's ways and your plans are gonna be God's plans? Because you know what happened? Jesus Christ came, he shed his blood, the veil was torn in the temple, now I have access to the presence of God. I don't need to go to a priest anymore. I have access to the Father right now. I am a priest and a minister to him right where I sit in my life. You are priests. But that means that there is a purifying and a purging that must be done in your life and in my life. If we're to experience and host the presence of God like we are supposed to. Okay? It's no more patty cake church anymore. It is time for us to step it up. And to, and to welcome in and to host the presence of God like we are supposed to. Because as, as he pours into us, he's expecting us to pour it out into the world. And what happens? He'll continue to fill us up. As we become more and more purified, he will entrust us with more so we can continue to pour it out into the world. Because there is a lost and dying world out there that needs a person that will come and say, I am purified as gold and as silver. I've been purged. And here is the presence of God to be poured out to you right now says the world is groaning and looking for those who are called the sons and daughters of God. That's who he's looking for. So let's go on. So say this with me. I am a house of prayer. We are a house of prayer. So we can fast forward a little bit. At this point, things, uh, Jesus has gone on to heaven, where I'm at here. He's ascended into heaven and is our great high priest, okay? And he sends the Holy Spirit to live in us and dwell in us. We no longer have to, to wait to get a word from a priest. 
we can go before the Father now and talk to him, have conversation with him. He's waiting on you. He's waiting to have conversations with you. He's waiting for you to come before him with clean hands and a pure heart. He's waiting for you to to just lay it all out before him. He's not here to beat you over the head. That's not the kind of God we serve. This purifying and this purging is for cleansing so that he can commune with us even more, so that he can impart into us even more. It's not so that he can beat us over the head. It's not so that we'll leave the prayer room hurting more. Listen, if you leave prayer hurting more than when you went in, you're not going into prayer properly. If you leave depressed from from the presence of God, you're not praying to the right person. Because what he said is, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when I go into the presence of God to have conversations with him, I'm going to give him my heavy. He's going to give me his light, and I'm going to walk out free and clear. That is conversation with God. We need to do it individually, as a family, and as a body of Christ, corporately. Everybody look to your left. Look to the people to your left. Okay, you see the beautiful, everybody on the, okay, smile. Everybody smile so they can see all your, okay, everybody look to your right now. Look to your right. Okay, everybody smile. Smile at them. Look at all their fives, their tens, their twenties, their thirties, whatever they got left. Just look at them whether they're real or not. (laughs) Everybody you just looked at is a part of your body. Not one of us make up the entire body. So anyway, at this point, Jesus has ascended. He sent the Holy Spirit, and we've now transitioned from a brick and stone uh, uh, resting place or hosting place for the Holy Spirit to now us being containers for the the presence of God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 3.16. Well, they already have it up there. Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, are God's temple his sanctuary. This place here is not the sanctuary. You are his sanctuary. And that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. To be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. I believe oftentimes we've become so individual-minded that we've forgotten that the presence of God is, is, is for us corporately, is for us as a body. There are places, and I'm getting ahead of my notes, but there are places and in, in prayers and in, in anointings that we can only experience when we come together in prayer, we, when we come together in a symbol, okay? Now, you are a temple. Say, I am a temple. We are a temple. Okay, so as priests unto God, we got, we're pre, we got priests in here, right? As priests unto God and a temple of the Holy Spirit, we are responsible before God for what we do and we don't allow in. Let me say that again. As priests and as temples of God, the Holy Spirit, we are responsible before God for what we do and we don't allow in. So we can look back now at that phrase that I wanted you to hold on to. It says, they abused the temple and they corrupted the intention of it. Here's my question. Have we abused our temples and corrupted the intention of it? Last time I checked, my Bible said that Jesus told us that greater work shall you do. I'm still waiting to see that. So that tells me that we still have a corrupted body that does not look the way it should because we should be doing greater works. I'm going to let that just sit there. Let it just simmer. So in our personal lives, because our personal lives affect things when we assemble. So in my personal life, how have, I, how have I corrupted the intention? Pride? Lying? Rebellion? Foul mouth? 
spiritual laziness? What could it be that I have done that has corrupted the original intention of the hosting place that God has designed? We're at TCLV, right? Let me talk to you for a minute. Can I, be, can I just be real with you? Somebody said I had the chain on today, so I was kind of gangster. So um, <laughs> let me just get real with you for a second. We've transitioned from El Shaddai to the center Lehigh Valley, right? In that transitional process, have I made it hard for the transition? Has my attitude made it difficult for the transition? Have I gone along and said, God, I don't know it all, I don't understand it all, but that's faith, but I'm just trusting you that you're speaking to the leaders that are helping us through this transition, and I'm gonna be right there with them, submitting to them, and doing whatever we gotta do to make this work. Have I corrupted the temple, though, and said, no, mm -mm. no, we're not supposed to do that. No, 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 that don't look right. That don't sound right. That's not what I'm used to. I just want to be real with you for a second. Because God's presence wants to be in this place like it's never been before. God wants to, we, we, it's an icebreaker ministry. People aren't going to like it. But God wants to be in this place and rest in this place and have a, a, a home and dwelling place in this body as a whole so that we are actually breaking the ice. So that when other ministries come through this area or, set or, 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 or come into this territory, the ice has already been broken, that they can host the presence of God, no problem, that, no, that people aren't gonna give them a hard time about it either, that they'll say, you know what? They broke the ice over there, they've already laid the foundation, we're just gonna build on top of it. So, I want us to examine ourselves. When you leave here, ask Holy Spirit when you're in the car. Holy Spirit, is there anything in my life, is there any way that I have corrupted the original intention that you have designed for me as a resting place and a hosting place? Is there anything in my life, highlighted in my life, if there's something that is causing a block from the presence of God to rest wholly on my life? So, what are we talking about? We're talking about refining, we're talking about purging because we are priests and we are kings, we are a temple, but we're talking about repentance. Get this, a heart of repentance strengthens my conversations with God because it strengthens my faith. Let me say that one more time. A heart of repentance strengthens my conversations with God because it strengthens my faith. I am able to come before God with clean hands and a pure heart because of repentance. I'm able to stand before him and say, God, I am, white, uh, I am washed as white as snow by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know that I can have a conversation with you clearly now because I'm not trying to hide any of my dirt. So the focus of repentance is to change our way of thinking until the presence of God fills our consciousness, okay? The, the focus of repentance, see, repentance has gotten a bad rap. It's been given a bad name. We've seen it as repentance as, okay, you're bad, you sit in the corner now. No, re God sees repentance as a way to draw you back into the original design that he had all the way back in the garden because he said, he said, Marilyn, he said, uh, uh, Joseph, he, he said, I desire to walk with you. I desire to commune with you. I desire to talk with you. So that's what repentance does. It brings us back to the Father. So, any area, though, of our life that is not occupied by the Spirit of God or by God's ways will either be filled up with the works of the flesh or the demonic. I that's a whole teaching in itself. Okay? It's a whole teaching. But any area that we don't fill with him will be filled with me or will be filled with the enemy. He'll be sure to fill it if you don't fill it. So we must identify those areas evict the things that don't belong in the courtyard of our temple and put the presence of God in that place. Invite him in to that place. So, the easiest way to know who's taking up space in any area of our life, look at the fruit. Look at my marriage. Is the presence of God resting on my marriage? Look at the fruit of it. Are we arguing all the time? Are we fussing all the time? 
The presence of God is not resting in that place there. Not jointly, maybe individually. We can look at us as a body. How am I aligning with those who are to my left and to my right so that I can host the presence of God? Or what is the fruit between my relationships and the person that's sitting with me to my left or to my right? Is there tension between them and me? Do I have a chip on my shoulder? What might it be? What is the fruit in that area? Or can I say that I'm walking in love with this person, that the joy of the Lord is my strength, even though they're messing up and they get on my nerves sometimes, it's okay because I'm gonna walk in the perfect love that Father has placed on the inside of me with them. That's the fruit that we need. That's good and healthy fruit. Because when we produce that kind of fruit, when we leave this place, when we go out into the, onto the streets and the highways and the byways, we present a fruit that is accepted. We present a sweet fruit to the people that we encounter. Who wants to be around a person that has stanky fruit coming off their tree? I can't tell you how many, how many bowls of fruit I've gone through because one bad apple got in there. So we're not talking about perfection, but we're talking about keeping our hearts positioned towards the Father, positioned properly before the Father. I'm almost done here. The cleansing of the temple, it provides a place for the manifest presence of God. Okay, let's go back and look. In Matthew 21, 12, Jesus cleansed the temple. It says, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Okay, the cause. Let's look at the effect now. Verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. When we cleanse the temple as a body, we are right before our brothers and sisters were able to align with them. We position ourselves to be a place that is an invitation to the supernatural here in this house. That's what happens. I gotta keep moving. So, here's a question I want you to answer. Are we gathering or are we assembling? Are we gathering or are we assembling? I can take a puzzle and I can drop it on a table and I can tell my son BJ, can you take all the pieces that are spread out across the table and you can, can you gather them for me? You know what he's gonna do? He's gonna, he's, gonna ship, he's gonna go like this and get all the pieces and get them on a pile. What's the problem? The pieces aren't connected to create a picture. They aren't connected to create a picture. But what does assembling do? Assembling creates a beautiful picture. I would challenge it and say, assembling creates the picture of the bride of Christ that Jesus desires to see. When he looks down at us, does he see a puzzle that's been all put together? Does he see body parts that have been all put together that looks like the bride that he desires? The bride that he can work through? The bride that he says, I'm coming back for that beautiful thing right down there. So are we assembling or are we gathering? I believe they have it on the screen. I'll just read it real quick for the sake of time. Ephesians 4, 16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing, what? And full of love. Somebody say, full of love. As the worship team's getting ready to come, during these last and greatest days of the church, God is looking for prayers, who will draw near not only to him, but will draw near to each other because that is assembling together. 